right, well, greetings, everyone. It's time for Bible study. Uh, this week, it's the 19th day of the month of May, 2012, the 27th day of the month of E.R., and the 42nd day of the Omer count. Well, that means it's the last day or six, seventh day of the sixth week, the week of Yasad, which is the week of foundation or bonding, and the day of Malkut, which is the day of kingship, royalty, leadership, sovereignty, rulership. <clears throat> or you might say God's government. Uh, so this is a day we work on ex expanding and extending the governmental aspect of laying the right foundation, the foundation of Torah righteousness and faith. You know, the foundation of our life is faith in God, which leads us to obedience to God's Torah or his teaching, his commandments. And then expanding that into the kingdom that is everywhere and in every nook and cranny of the universe throughout the kingdom of God or the kingdom of peace, the kingdom of eternity. So we have to lay the right foundation and then expand it out to complete the building. If the foundation's wrong, the building's going to be wrong. If the foundation is wood, hay, and stubble, the building will never survive. And God builds for eternity. And he's building his character into our lives and in our minds and our hearts so we can be a part of his eternal government of all things. A part of the ruling family, ruling family of the universe, the family of God, the family of Elohim, the family of Yahweh. So we have a tremendous potential, a tremendous purpose in our lives, a tremendous destiny, and something to really count important and look at with, with awe and respect and praise and thanksgiving to God. He didn't call us to be worms. He didn't call us to be dust of the earth. He didn't call us to be caterpillars, but he called us to be his very own sons. And so he's given us minds like his mind. And as it says in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And the, in the image of God made he him. <clears throat> so that's a tremendous... Uh, thing to think about you know God means what he says and people can ridicule it they can be deceived well they are deceived we live in a very deceived world today so I want to talk about what's happening in the world and and uh, what it means to us and where we are in our walk before God you know, this thing about the foundation, this is a, the week of the, laying the right foundation, and the foundation for society is the family. God created men, Adam, and then he created Eve, a man and a woman, and then he said they are to cleave together, come together, and become a family, and to have children, and to multiply. And that creates then a family. And you have parents, adults, and then you have children. And the children grow up to become adults and then parents. And, and the cycle keeps continuing. And the population keeps expanding greater and greater. So the basis of God's kingdom is the family. And the relationships that we develop. And, you know, we hear a lot in the world about broken relationships. People just can't get along. Or they fight. One thing comes up or another thing comes up. And there's a lack of wisdom. A lack of godly understanding. A lack of obedience to God. A lack of patience and endurance. And so, angers flare and tempers flare and 
people sometimes come to the Rubicon and they, they think they can go no further or they burn their bridges and 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 some some people wind up living lives of utter futility and loneliness because of decisions they made earlier when they were yet immature and they 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 got into things which they weren't ready for like like maybe marriage or they get into relationships they weren't ready for they were and they they they, they become self-destructive and they destroy the relationship because of anger temper and lack of self-control which is another thing we're working on during the summer count was the, the second week is the week <coughs> of iron discipline and self-mastery or self-control and that and all the aspects of God's character do include the element of self-control and sometimes we as human beings we flare up and, and things get out of control and of course we know there's Satan the devil is there lurking in the background to ambush us and catch us unawares and like he did to Peter when Peter re <laughs> took Christ aside so to speak and began to rebuke mm -hmm. God rebuke the Messiah and said, "Don't shall not be that way with you, Lord." You know, because Christ was foretelling to the disciples his own death. Peter didn't get it, and he said, "No, no, no, it's not going to be that way, Lord." He didn't realize the spirit that he was of and what voice he was listening to in his mind when he said that. And so Christ rebuked him and said, uh, "Peter, Peter." I uh, forget the exact words, but uh, the Lord rebuke you, or yeah. Satan, uh, get the head, Satan. Uh, uh, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Sometimes we get in that situation, and somehow when we're unawares and we're just kind of going giddily down the road, and Satan just attacks us like a roaring lion or, or grabs us like a python snake. And we are totally unaware and he assaults us in the mind and gives us an evil thought. Sometimes just some little thing and, you know, we're trying to solve a family problem and the family problem escalates and gets worse because of a lack of wisdom and understanding and self-control. I had an, exa an example of that brought to me this week. I, I don't want to be make this too personal for anybody, but I just want to use a couple of examples of this. One was several years ago in our home in Pasadena, California. We were having Bible study and services, and, and I forget what day it was, but it was a Sabbath day. It might have even been a feast day. And my wife had some fruit out on the table, and there was a banana there in the kitchen. And uh, one of the people who was there with us, observing the feast, had a little girl, and then she went through the kitchen and grabbed a banana. Mm. And Kathy was standing <coughs> Kathy was standing there and she looked at her and said, well, uh, uh, I forget the exact words, uh, you know, but she said basically, well, uh, what are you doing? No, that's good. Did she have permission? She, then she asked her if she had permission to have the banana. And that kind of flustered and confounded the girl because uh, she didn't. She didn't ask anybody if she could have a banana. She just took it. Well, anyway, so she told her mother about this, and uh, her mother got very irate and uh, that uh, her daughter had been accused of stealing a banana in her mind, and it should have been overlooked. And then she told her mother, who was the wife of a of an elder, good friend of ours, good friend of mine, but the wife was a, a newbie. 
his long-term wife had died years before. Anyway, then she heard about it, and she got very angry and and uh, began to get an evil attitude. An evil spirit came upon her and in her, and she began to just be very negative about everything. And, and uh, oh, that precious little girl, you know, and they, they, they left the feet, they left the uh, day, I guess it was Passover or whatever, uh, after that, and they, they let, they're very angry, and, and it developed into a seed of bitterness. And they just got hostile. And, uh, and all of this was over a little banana. Can you imagine? They began to criticize and complain, and what is it, dear? What I didn't know was that her mother and her grandmother took a banana earlier. I don't need these extra details, you know. This is years ago, yeah. and if the mother and grandmother had all had a banana before that, oh. and they took it, and they didn't ask, well, they sure set a great example for their little daughter, didn't they? Oh, they did. If you're gonna take fruit from someone's fruit bowl, you should ask. I don't care if you're a hundred years old. <laughs> Although I would make an issue of it, right. of course. But anyway, these were not a, these people weren't a hundred years old. They 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 weren't suffering from Alzheimer's disease. They they didn't forget whose home they were in. They were just being kind of selfish, self-centered, taking other people's things. And there's a lot of other examples, but can you imagine a big firestorm being developed over a single banana? <coughs> oh. Because they would not just repent and say, well, we're sorry. Or they would not just tell their little girl, well, you know, honey, you should ask permission before you take something. But they didn't do it themselves, apparently. Cappy tells me now, they would all taken the banana without asking. You know, sometimes people come into our fellowship, they look like Christians, they act like Christians, they dress like Christians, whatever that's supposed to mean, but they, they're they not Christians. They don't follow Christ. They don't have the spirit of God. They have the spirit of another spirit, as Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter 11. They entertain some other spirit. They, they're not truly of the family tree. Well, anyway, this other example is going to talk about the, the issue was uh, doing some dishes. They'd had their, their, their son was supposed to do certain chores around the house or the apartment, and one of those was to do the dishes uh, one time a week. No big deal, right? Well, it's funny how Satan attacks us on these little things. And uh, there was a lot of miscommunication, apparently. And uh, the father's attitude was, well, he expected his uh, the boy to do the dishes. And he did the dishes. But then he checked later, and the pots and pans weren't done. And so he, they decided to take away the boy's uh, game, video game player, or whatever you call it, uh, as a punishment. And, but they, the way it happened, they didn't uh, lay this out beforehand. He didn't know there was disagreement between, uh, you know, the, the wife was planning to get the boy to do the dishes this week, the next week she'd tell him how to do the pots and the pans. Mm -hmm. But the father didn't get the relationship there and they get it clued in, so he thought he was supposed to do all the dishes and the pots and pans weren't done, so he took away the boy's game station or game player, whatever they call it. And that led to a big scene and, and things escalated and tempers flared and and uh, why well, I was told the story, you know, I mean, the husband became a rather very unhappy and everybody was uh, suffering, the whole family was suffering. All because of a few dirty dishes, or I'm sorry, 
a few pots and pans and it hadn't been made clear in the beginning that they were included so I told everybody just to back off start over go back to the beginning you know and you might say count to a hundred and go back and start over and re look, take another look they'd made a contract that there, certain things were to be expected and they'd had the contract signed but the contract was incomplete it didn't spell out anything about dishes you know that was just added later as a, a, a addendum part as part of the contract but uh, I said, well, look, you need to do what God did when, when it, God gave Israel the Ten Commandments and the contract. And then they broke the Ten Commandments. They didn't fulfill them the way they were supposed to. So God had mercy on them and gave them another set of Ten Commandments, which is a type of the New Covenant. The Old Covenant didn't work, so God replaced it with the New Covenant, which is spiritual in its dimensions and it goes further than the old covenant because it has spiritual promises and spiritual rewards including eternal life so now we're signed on to the new covenant <coughs> so I suggested this family should write up a new covenant since the old one was misunderstood and broken and there was a you know, a little short-sightedness all around and they should redo it and make it complete and make it clearly understood what the duties are and get everybody to sign off on it. Another thing I said, judging this was based upon my wife and I and our example with our one of our daughter, Nancy, years ago. Nancy was a rather wild teenager, uh, into her 20s now, uh, then I mean, and uh, very free spirited and a very daring uh, individual. I mean, she would took risks that other people wouldn't think of and uh, rode her bike in dangerous situations sometimes and almost got run over once or twice. And she was a triathlete and ran and swam and bicycled and and uh, tried to do all this being a vegetarian. That was kind of... But she was a remarkably lovely, wonderful young woman, and everybody loved her, and she loved everybody. But she was way too trusting. To, to, you might say she asked my wife one time, well, why are, why are people so... What was the word? Yeah, why don't people do what's right? Our daughter Nancy was uh, very brave and took a lot of risks, and but she wondered why why don't people do what's right? Well, you know, times she didn't always do what was right. She didn't always use her use wisdom, and she bought a car once, a little Triumph Spitfire, because she was enamored with it. And her sister told her not to buy it. Her brother told her not to buy it. I told her not to buy it. You know, because it had no reverse gear. Couldn't go backwards. But she didn't listen to anybody, and she went and bought it. <laughs> you know, she wanted it so bad. And it had problems. It wasn't licensed properly either, so she had problems. I forget how she got rid of it. But Nancy was getting to be hard to control. And Cappy and I, I was ready to pull out my hair, and Cappy was frustrated. And, and anyway, we finally, I, I, we, we, a friend of ours told us about a Christian psychiatrist or psychologist in Los Angeles, in Pasadena area, that uh, they'd gone to for counseling with their, one of their children. And he really was very good. So we called up and made an appointment to talk to this young counselor, a very nice man. And we went in, and Nancy went in, and we sat down, and he began to show me a lot. You know, we wanted Nancy to be obedient and to listen to her parents. 
but her side of the story was she wanted some freedom to stay out late at night and do things with her friends. And the counselor basically told her, well, you know, if, if you don't listen to your parents and you do just stay out all night and do your own thing, uh, you'll wind up in juvenile hall or at a, at a home. You know, and uh, if you talk against your parents, uh, you'll be off on your own, juvenile hall or put in a foster home. Is that what you want? Yes. We went and got counsel from a counselor, and he said, why don't you both sides step back and negotiate this and decide on what you'll both accept? You know, uh, Nancy, maybe you need to accept certain limitations on your behavior. And Mr. and Mrs. Dankenbrink, you need to give her a, a little more time and opportunity uh, and just what will you both accept in, in terms of behavior, what the issues were. You know, can she stay out all night? And the answer is no. And she said, well, but at least can I stay out till 11 o'clock or midnight sometimes? And so we came to a modus operandi, uh, a certain, uh, we uh, negotiated settlement of what the rules would be that she would adhere to. It was how we achieved peace in the family. You know, God loves a peacemaker. And we all need to become peacemakers. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And over in the book of Romans, chapter 12, the Apostle Paul tells us the attitude we should have toward one another, especially members of our own family. And he says in verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Don't just pretend you love someone. Don't feign it, but really love them. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Romans 12 verse 9. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. That means you don't get in their face and chew them out and argue with them in honor giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence but fervent in spirit serving the Lord. We all serve the Lord. And we should always keep that in mind so we don't get into useless arguments or position positionalism I think I might call it where someone says well I'm the head of the house I'm the head of the house it's kind of like the old uh, Mikado you know the, uh, the the stage play the Mikado uh, the the Emperor of Japan or whatever it was Lord the Lord High Executioner I am the Lord High Executioner they had a song about it in the Mikado well the father the head of the home is not the Lord High Executioner is he hope not he's supposed to be a shepherd for his family a shepherd leader as, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, 
chapter 5, I mean. He says, The elders who are among you, I exhort, and that would include fathers of families, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock, of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, that is, not being an overlord, but being an example to the flock. Well, this also applies to fathers in homes. The father is an elder. He's, his flock is his family. And Peter says he should shepherd the family, not by compulsion, but willingly, according to God, not as being lords or masters, the margin says, but as examples to the flock. Well, in a father, uh, you know, as Christ said, we are to be peacemakers. God wants peace, not argument and yelling and screaming in the family. He wants families to learn to get along together and he wants us all to learn submission to one another in a righteous sense in a godly sense what do I mean by that I, I mean sometimes the father the head of the home the overseer the minister must submit it's not, it's not a one way street it's not that the flock is always going to submit to the master or the elder or the overseer but he has to submit himself to their situations, their frailties, their problems, their issues, and patiently, conscientiously, genuinely love them and patiently hear them out and then give them whatever advice that he can from the Lord. You know, he should be a peacemaker to strive for peace. Often in world affairs, the way nations come to peace is by a negotiated settlement. They come to terms so they don't have to go to war. They maybe have an argument over a border, a border dispute, or a piece of land, or an island, or something. <coughs> or fishing rights. But they come to some uh, modus operandi, some agreement that they both sign off on. The United States and Canada had to come to an agreement many, many years ago on where the border was between the state of Washington and Montana and uh, Idaho and Canada. Now, there was, a, there was an election years ago in America with the theme of the election was 54, 40 year fight, which meant the 54th uh, parallel would be our northern border or we would fight for it, according to that political party. Well, if I, I think they decided that that was asking for too much and they settled for a different border uh, because it was settled peaceably and war did not erupt between the U.S. and Canada at that time. But family disputes have to be settled by, as Isaiah says, or God says in Isaiah chapter 1, Come let us reason together, says the Lord. You have to come together and listen to every side, every one, and then reach an amicable, agreeable solution. A negotiated settlement. It's called peacemaking. And in Romans chapter 12 again, God goes on and says, 
in verse 17, we pay no one evil for evil. Don't just strike back at people. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. That is, provide good for all men. Don't provide evil. If it is possible, verse 18, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably with all men. Then <coughs> it's better to suffer injury and to suffer hurt and suffer loss than to fight and strive and struggle and demand respect. That doesn't work. Respect has to be given, which means that the person that wants respect, if they really want real respect, they have to earn it by their fruits and their good works and their being a servant king or a servant lord. You know, Christ tells us in, well, first let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Hebrews 12, 14. The Apostle Paul explains how we all go through chastening. Circumstances sometimes, family issues and debates and fights may be considered a form of chastening. They don't have to happen, but we are human and we all have human nature and human nature rears up its ugly head. Like, like Jeremiah said, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and Paul said that the carnal mind is hostility toward God in Romans 8 verse 7 and we all were born with this carnal mind and we live in this society which the carnal mind gets rubs off on us by examples bad examples all around us and in our school system People learn to be selfish and they learn to be carnal. They learn to, they come under wrong influences. We have to fight against that and struggle against that. That's another thing the Omer count is all about is overcoming human nature, overcoming the carnal mind, overcoming the desire for self-importance and, and demanding respect from other people and obedience and other people to toe the line. We have to learn to submit, not just to expect others to submit to us, the Lord High Executioner. We have to learn that we're not the Lord High Executioner. We're just servants of God. We're to serve God and our families to serve God and we're to show them how to serve God without fighting and war and strife because fighting and war leads to death destruction and eventually the lake of fire unless you're fighting for God on God's side and he calls you to fight but like Christ said right now is not our time to fight but after Christ returns and we're made immortal spirit beings, then will be our time to fight against the nations of the world and to carry out the wrath of God upon the world. Right now, we're just to be ambassadors for Christ. Examples, lights to let our light shine, the light of the gospel, the light of true freedom and liberty in Christ, to let that shine forth. We don't let it shine if we're behaving like a monster or jackass. We have to be very careful in how we behave and how we lead our families. And this next week of the Omer count is the week of leadership or kingship or sovereignty or government. How can you govern others and your family if you're not really governing yourself? and you're demanding all this respect from others, how much respect are you showing others? Mm. You know, so in Romans, Paul does say, 
Well, I've already read Romans. But here in uh, Hebrews, he says, verse 11, Now no chastening, that is, these problems that come up, seems to be joyful for the present, but painful to have to go through them. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it, to those who have been exercised by it, who go through it, and who learn the lesson from it. It's not automatic. People can go through punishment and whippings and all that and just get a worse attitude and become more rebellious and more angry, you know. I mean, God wants us to benefit by profiting from these experiences and by coming to a state of repentance and yielding and submission to one another. As Paul says elsewhere, submit ye one to another. It's not a one-way street. We all need to submit and hear out the others and listen and not demand obedience all the time. God doesn't. God's very forgiving. He forgives us our sins over and over again when we're not obedient, as long as we come to him and apologize and repent. I mean, God knows our flesh, that we're made of dust and that we have these carnal impulses raging sometimes in our bodies, <coughs> in our minds. People get proud and, and a little high up and think that they're the Lord High Executioner or, uh, or a corporal in the army and hmm. goes to their head. And we need to not be that way, but we need to be like Christ who set us an example of humility. He was equal to God. He was of the same plane as God the Father, but he gave up his divinity and divested himself of it, as the Moffat translation says, and became a man, flesh and blood human being. Gave up all of the glory that he had with the Father and just became a man. Humbled himself, as Moffat says, he emptied himself. Well, how about us? How do we sometimes humble ourselves and just empty ourselves? before our mate or our children to set them an example or do we demand respect all the time and demand worship that's not God's way so he says here in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 12 therefore hang down the hands which rather rather strengthen the hands that hang down in the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. Walk uprightly and in straight lines. Don't go wandering off. So that what is lame may not be dislocated. So if something's weak, it can be strengthened. But rather be healed. Heal the relationship. Heal the relationship. So there's no, no, none of this infighting and yelling and screaming and cursing and swearing and Things that happen between human beings. They get so mad they even get to the point of cursing or swearing or using bad language. That's not godly. That's not Christian. And he says in verse 14, pursue peace. Pursue peace. Now, what does that say to you? To me, it reminds me of a man on a horse and peace is out there like a like a, a, a fox. That fox is scampering away, and you want to get peace, you're going to have to pursue it. You're going to have to get that horse to gallop and run fast to catch that fox. Peace is elusive. It's hard to track down and it's hard to catch. So, in in England, old jolly old England, they used to have, and maybe still do somewhat, the fox hunt. And the nobles would get together with their horses and their jockeys, or their 
their uh, not jockeys, but their their attendants, and they go on a fox hunt. And they had a lot of dogs there, bloodhounds, and the, they let the bloodhounds loose and tally ho, and they charge off across the countryside, chasing the fox. Well, we need to pursue peace. Pursue it means chase it, go after it, seek it diligently, zealously. Run for it. Don't don't just uh, saunter along, you know. But run like your life depended on it. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, he says. Looking very carefully, lest anyone falls short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness, that is antagonism or sour spirit, springing up in your heart, in your mind, trouble you. And by this, Paul says, many become defiled. They allow things to get so far out of hand that they can't control it, or they won't control it, and they just go to pieces. You know, and sometimes it all starts out over a banana, or a few dishes that weren't washed. Oh, the world's coming to an end! He forgot the pots and the pans. Rawr, rawr, rawr. I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> well, there Cappy goes, just shrugging again. Yeah, I've, I've had experience. I'm, I'm, you know, we've all had arguments. I'm just joking mm. about being pretty good at this. I mean, you know... The, People can just get bent out of shape, and then that causes other people to get bent out of shape. And sometimes it can become very destructive of the family. And if a man does that toward his wife, they can destroy the wife, or make her go into a shell, or make her just become, feel hopeless, helpless, and even become depressed. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I don't know all the causes of depression. I'm not sure anybody does, but I know that family strife and lack of unity and and lack of humility and a lack of people learning to submit to one another is a cause of a great deal of problems in the family. And in Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul tells us a little bit about family relations. <clears throat> family relations. Ephesians chapter 5, Beginning in verse 18, he says, And don't be drunk with wine. Don't You can sure destroy a family relationship by having a drunkard. Someone that over, you know, gets tipsy and drinks too much. Because then I mean, a lot of men get <coughs> very violent with strong drink. And when they're drunk and they lose control, they don't have any self-control. That's evil. Is don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit of God. Ask God for more of His Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Keep yourself positive by singing songs to you, for yourself that make you feel positive. And making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always, he says, for all things, even for the trials. 
even for the tests that come that make us stronger, give thanks for all things that leaves nothing out. To God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. See there, we read right over that, but we have a tendency to. But we're to be submitting to one another. Yielding is another way to say it. Yielding to one another. As long as it's, as long as it's within the laws of God, and you're not going to do something contrary to God's law, you should have an attitude of being willing to yield on issues or discussions or arguments. So, like one person said, well, I want to go to Big Five. Another person said, no, I want to go to Big R. <laughs> Two stores here in Omac. Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to get a big argument over it and a fight? Or, well, or can they? Can you just yield? Say, well, all right, we'll go to the, the one you want to go to, or going out to dinner or breakfast or something. I want to go to Magoo's. One says. Another says, "Why well, I want to go to Breadline?" There's certainly nothing to fight over. Although sometimes we can fi find up reasons to maybe argue and fight. One might say, "I want to go to." Uh, What's the name of that Spanish place? Rancho Chico. Rancho Chico for lunch. And one says, no, they have too much bread and, and uh, flour and salt. That's bad for you. We need to, let's go to China Star. You know, you can get into a real gangbang, uh, well, real, real Donnybrook, real fight over choices of a restaurant. Or can we just yield to one another? Now, one time go to one, another time go to the other one. <coughs> so we should be submitting to one another in the fear of God. So that means when you're submitting to the other, it's in the fear of God and with awe and respect toward God. Not just because you have to, or not, not just even just to make peace, but because you fear God and God wants peace. God doesn't want to spend His time sorting out our little dinky problems. You know those two sons of mine down there. Look at my son and my daughter down there. They can't even agree on a banana. Oh, I mean, God's got the universe to think about and the planets and the stars and the galaxies and the comets and all the wildlife and all the fish of the sea and he knows all the sparrows that fall he knows every hair on everybody's head on every continent in the world second by second because they keep falling out <laughs> so the number of hairs on people's heads keeps changing but he can identify every hair on every head to the exact number at any moment. But does he really have time to teach us about the banana or about the dirty dishes? Or can we learn these things and become godly? You know, we've had a few problems here in OMAC about a well that I have had problems with the last four or five years and I've put in four, I think about four different pumps in that well. Then a pump is usually put in that's under warranty. And the people that put it in never did do it right. So I've learned until this last time. But they put it in and they they leave off a valve, like a backflow valve in the, in the well pipe, so that when the pump goes off, the water doesn't start flowing back down into the pump in reverse and start to destroy all the impellers in the pump. Mm -hmm. They neglect to put a valve in the pipe because the excuse was apparently, well, there's one in the pump. 
but this latest pump man that came out said, well, the one in the pump is really virtually no good. It's not strong. It's not good enough. You got to have one in the in the well pipe. So they he put one in. Plus they gave we uh, they gave us a much better pump this time. We had to pay for it, of course. But we got a very good discount on it. And it has a what do you call that a screen that uh, controller. a controller. And if something goes wrong, a message lights up on the controller, telling you basically exactly what's wrong and what. So what you need to do about it so you can turn it off and then turn the pump back on press the start button uh, like like it might say uh, open line or leak in the line we had uh, one line running all night and all day and the pump shut off and Dale went down and found out it said leak in the line and I he told me about it and I said oh yeah that's right Scotty left the line open on the top of the hill to water all that grass up there that needed water and and he and he the next day he threw his back out didn't come to work so the, so that sprinklers up there stayed on all day and all night oh, boy. and uh, so what happened that's all right for the land but uh, the pump took that as a message that there was a leak in the line and it automatically shut down so you know we started Dale started it up again and it's working fine and I went up there and turned that faucet off so those two lines would those two uh, sprinklers uh, rotating sprinklers would would shut down and uh, but I, I got to the point a year ago I was calling that well the well from hell it was to me. It was just like that well down in the Caribbean Sea that blew out all that black oil uh, uh, two years ago. They called that the well from hell. Well, that was a pretty bad oil spill, no doubt about it. But but this was our personal well from hell. It seemed like after replacing four pumps in about five six years, I've just had enough. But this time we got someone else to come in. This man used, is very experienced and very good in the state of Washington, and was, was even on the water board, of the well drilling board of the state. And he pointed out the guy that originally drilled my well over there for my dad years ago. They had more problems with his wells than anybody else in the whole state of Washington. And he he just did it in such a way that they were often unstable. So we went down that we went he he redid the well bottom to put in a new casing in the bottom and put in a new pump with all the gadgets on it and and uh, we found that well there are some problems there. He had to go in and raise the pump up about three feet from the bottom because when it was on the bottom it kept sucking up sand. It's an unstable situation. But we're hopeful now with it being three feet above the bottom and we don't, you know, we can uh, have uh, some stability there. But at least we know what the problem is and if necessary we can do other things. But, you know, we have to get the facts and communicate and be patient, and, and now oh, it's working out fine. Uh, I hope it continues to. Right now we have lots of water and lots of good water pressure. I've noticed that. In fact, the water pressure was so good it blew out a couple lines. Oh. <coughs> that is one up at the house, at the trailer, uh, and another one in a, in a irrigation line. Uh, it popped so we found those leaks though and, and Scotty, Scotty fixed them and we haven't had a problem uh, now at all well so this you know we have to submit to one another by listening to one another first of all I had to listen to the well man and seek counsel and advice 
and get on the telephone and talk to the right people and I found out the one I had been using just to put in the well, uh, uh, the pumps rather, was really just not up to snuff. They're just getting a little old and they weren't really checking out the pumps when they took them out of the well if there was something wrong. They just slip in another one under warranty and tootle off down the road. That didn't help me. The next thing I knew, that pump was bad. Until we get to the root cause, it would just keep happening. Now I feel a lot better about it. But the same thing with family problems. you got to get to the root cause of the problem and investigate the roots and then dig up the roots and change the whole infrastructure of the problem. you got to lay a solid foundation. This week is a week, the last day of the week of Yasad, of the Omer count, or the week of having a solid, righteous foundation. Our foundation ought to be the scriptures, the Torah, the Word of God, for our living and our decisions. And if it is, then we'll learn to do what it says. And to do what it says means that here, uh, verse 21, Submitting to one another in the fear of God. That, notice that comes first in verse 21. Then in verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Well, all right, number two then, wives need to submit and be respectful of their husbands as to the Lord. But should a husband then get up on his uh, high horse and demand respect? Because I'm the husband. Rah, rah, rah. No, 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 no. This is from Paul written to the wives and telling them to submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. This is like a private confidential message confidential message from God to the women, to the wives, saying, look, you need to submit to your husband and his authority as to the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to the Yeshua the Messiah. You need to be very respectful to him, but this is God is telling, Christ is telling you this. Paul is telling you this. Your husband can read it, but it's not to him, it's to you. Because God has already spoken to your husband in verse 21, saying, submit to one another in the fear of God. So that means he's to submit to the wife, too. It's not one way. It's, it's a two-way street. The husband submits to the wife and the family to one another and the wife is to submit to her own husband as to the Lord in a very special way. And the children are included in this. They're to be submissive to the authority of the parents as much as they can, as much as the parents allow them to be submissive and respectful. <coughs> now, if anybody does something out of line and does something and misbehaves, including a father that gets out of line and overly touchy and a little bombastic, it, you know, it can be hard to submit to someone like that. But if the, but if the father sets an example like Christ and like the holy men of old, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses, the meekest man in the earth in his day, that the husband will set an example of meekness and humility, then it'll be a lot easier for him to wear the mantle of the leader of the family. It's a, we all have to learn humility and to be submissive. A, a king without being humble is a tyrant. A 
dictator. And God hasn't called us to be dictators or tyrants. Then he says down here, verse 25, husbands, husbands, this is for you, husbands. This is for you. You love your wives. Don't pretend to love them. Don't just say you love them. Genuinely love them. And if you really love them, you'll be willing to die for them. As Christ was loved the church so much, he was willing to give his life and die for the church. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. We are to love them with a patience and a consuming love that masters the mouth so we don't say cruel things and don't get in their face and yell and curse and swear or talk nasty or talk belligerently or loudly. And I, I sometimes get to surprised. You know, I'm, I'm just a ordinary old codger, I guess, sometimes. I, I take after my dad. And uh, I, have a, I, I have a temper. And sometimes I've let, I've let it fly. I can't remember the last time. It must have been about 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or oh, was that five years ago? Uh, oh, five months? Five months. Well, five days? Five months. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> no. I don't know what it was. I can't. Re I, I know that we've had a few uh, times where Kathy and I disagreed over something, and we just didn't agree. And sometimes it gets to the point where, where you get a little upset. I, I admit it. I mean, I'm not perfect, and I know God sometimes gets upset with human race and all of us. He was so upset with Israel at one point. He said, "I'm going to just destroy them and wipe them all out." Moses, get out of my way. And Moses interceded. <coughs> for Israel and said, no, Lord, don't do that, please. You know, they're just children. They're just children. And here you brought them out of Egypt by your great name. And 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 if you were to wipe them out, then all the Gentile nations would chortle and laugh and guffaw and say, look at that God of Israel. He's worthless. He couldn't even save his own people without destroying them. Nobody can please him. He said, that would be terrible for your reputation. I'm with the lad living here and adding to what Moses technically said. But he said, for your, but don't destroy them for your own namesake, your own reputation, and, and have mercy on them. And, 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 and God said, okay, uh, you've convinced me. Now, I don't know whether God allowed that to happen as a test for Moses to see if Moses would come to that conclusion or for our benefit. So we might see that we need to be forgiving as God is forgiving, even when he is greatly riled up, you might say, he's still willing to forgive and to give us another chance. But we should not take advantage of it or disadvantage of it. We should appreciate the chance and then repent. Now Israel did repent at that time and Moses had to go back up in the mountain another 40 days. And this time they stood vigil diligently and blew the shofar every day that Moses was up on the tent on the Mount Sinai getting <coughs> the duplicate set of the Ten Commandments. And so they were watching this time and they didn't lose track of time in the count. They were counting down until Moses came back with the new set of the Ten Commandments. You know, we need to be counting the days till the coming of Christ, although we don't know the exact day. 
but we are in a countdown situation. And we don't want to be expecting it too soon and then give up when he doesn't come by that day. But we shouldn't be putting off his coming, thinking it's a long ways away either, so we get kind of negligent and begin to get lost in the world. And uh, to where we look just like the world looks. Like Israel and Egypt began to look just like the Egyptians. They were on 49th level of impurity. Almost all gone. So we need to be looking forward diligently and earnestly to the coming of the Messiah. Cleansing ourselves, sanctifying ourselves, setting ourselves apart and righteously overcoming all the poles of human nature and the tongue, that, which is hard to control, the hardest thing in our body to control is the human tongue. We can lash out at somebody else or say something out of place without proper thinking ahead and just start to create a commotion or turmoil or a fight or a verbal spat. But God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to serve Him in godliness and godly fear and unity and harmony and peace. Family peace. Peace in the family. Not a family in pieces. So, he says here in verse 25, to help cement the family relationship the godly relationship. He says, husbands, I got a something for you here too. Love your wives. Love them. If you love somebody, you're going to take time for them. You're going to listen to them. You're going to give them a hug, tell them you love them. Give them flowers, take them out to dinner, buy them nice clothes, buy them a nice ring, whatever. We just had our Cappy's wedding ring read down a few months ago. Down in Wenatchee, she'd read that a man was coming up from out of state who was a specialist in ring design. And we had a, a, a diamond ring that uh, it was diamond was getting a little loose in it. This, uh, our wedding ring, or one like it. And she had arthritis in the finger, and the, the knuckle was bigger, and she couldn't get the ring over the knuckle anymore. Couldn't get it off, or put it back on, whatever. So we went down there, and you cut it off? You had it cut off. I'm talking about the other ring. No, that's the reason we got the other ring. I, we bought a ring in New York City. And that's the one I had cut off. That's the one you had cut off. Because I couldn't get it off. Okay. And the diamond was loose. And well, the diamond was loose, and she couldn't get the ring off because of the arthritis swelling in the knuckles. So we had it cut off. Anyway, they they took that. We had a couple of other rings, older rings that had gold in them so we gave them and they weighed the gold and priced it out and gave us a discount on the new work done on the new ring and they redid the setting of it to where it's really nice looking I love it now it's beautiful and Cappy loves it and we got it all fixed up you know and we got the adjustable band so I can get and we got an adjustable band on it so she can get it on and off her finger uh, the way these adjustable bands work. So anyway, you know, take, we need to love our wives and spend the time and do things that really makes them feel special. And Kathy keeps telling me this, I have something like this, that, that for every <laughs> no, for every ounce, I think it's, tell, correct me if I'm wrong, for every ounce of love that the husband gives his wife, she will give him back two ounces, or double. Yeah, double. Double love. That's right. Not double trouble. 
double love. Right. For every ounce we give, we get back two ounces. So if we give a ton, we get back two tons. Anyway, I thought that's nice. Very nice. <clears throat> so why did Christ love the church then and give himself for her? Verse 26, so he might sanctify, set her apart and cleanse her with a washing of water by the word. <coughs> that he might present her to himself a glorious church. You know, and as a husband, I appreciate my wife looking good, looking glorious, with beautiful apparel and and a nice ring, and but especially in the heart and the spirit and the character. And that's what Christ wants from the church, for it to be a glorious church with glorious spiritual character. That she should be holy and without blemish, without a fault, not narcissistic, not selfish, not full of anger and resentments and doubts and critical attitudes, not a shrew, but a wonderful, loving, beautiful wife without any blemishes in her character. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies, as he who loves his wife loves himself. Verse 28. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For this reason, Paul says in verse 31, a man should leave father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So it, again, it's a two-way street. And we, we as the men and the husbands need to be the initiators of this. We need to love our wives, number one, that they then will love us back, number two, and we need to respect our wives and hold them with great respect, and they will then respect us, maybe twofold as well. But you know, if you're not respected, you won't get respect from the other person. If a man does not respect his wife, how in the world is she going to ever respect him? Can't happen. In order to be respected, you have to be respectable and respectful. We basically, we give as we get. If we that we get as we give, I should say. If we give respect, if we give love, we'll get it back in, in spades. But if we don't give love, if we don't give respect, if we treat somebody in a domineering fashion with an authoritarian dictatorship style, then that is pagan. That is wrong. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, tells us in Matthew chapter 22 or 21, or 23, Where is that now? I'm looking 
for the scripture yeah. where Christ says to the, his disciples that uh, the one that's greatest among them is the one who serves. <clears throat> I may not find this as quickly as I thought. But he says, among the Gentiles, people think greatness is to be served. How many servants do you have? Like in the case of King Solomon. But Christ said, I am among you as he that serves. He set us the example of the king who gave his life for his people. He came as one who serves. And the one who's greatest, he says, is the one who serves. Matthew 22 and full. Matthew what? 22 and full might be. Oh, you don't know? That's two different chapters, Walter. Verse and chapter. What? Maybe it's you saying verse and chapter. chapter. No, okay. I, well, anyway, you get the point. Here we go. It's chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. We have the story of James and John and their mother, Ze the sons of Zebedee. And their mother, verse 20, comes to Christ and says, uh, kneels down before him to ask something. And he says to her, verse 21, what do you wish? And she said to him, yeah, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and one on the left in your kingdom. She's not asking for much, is she? But Yeshua answered and said, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink of the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with a baptism <coughs> that I am baptized with? And they, James and John, were right there with their mother. And they said to him, We are able. <laughs> well, I think their attitude was all right. But their heart was, uh, they were not converted yet. They wanted to have a high position in Christ's kingdom, the very highest. Then he said to them, well, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism. That's the suffering, the suffering that I am going to go through. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. That's a choice God the Father will make. And I suspect maybe Moses will be on one side in the kingdom and Elijah on the other side. I don't know. But in the transfiguration, the two that appeared with Christ was Moses and Elijah. So, just an idea. When the ten heard about this story, they were greatly displeased and indignant with James and John. What? Trying to elevate yourselves above the rest of us? They looked on them with narrowed eyes, suspicion. They were greatly displeased, it says. Not just a little mildly unhappy. They were very unhappy or even angry but Jesus then called all of them to himself and kind of said get this this uh, thorn out of your saddle or get this thought out of your mind he said to them listen you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them overlord overlord the Lord High Executioner, they lord it over the people. In fact, in the days of the Persian Empire, you weren't even allowed to look upon the emperor. 
You'd have, when you pass by, you'd have to bow down on your knees in the street with your head bowed to the ground. You didn't dare to look upon the emperor. He says, those in the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. I'm the boss. I'm the dictator in the family. It's not the way to rule a family not the way to rule a kingdom either. It's not the way we're going to rule in God's kingdom as saints and kings and priests either. He says, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great, <coughs> to be great in the kingdom, yeah, who doesn't desire to be great in the kingdom? You know, we're all going to shine like stars forever and ever. Do you want to shine as a little tiny star, or do you want to shine as one of the big bright stars? Like Sirius. I think we all want to shine as a bright star. The brighter, the better. Well, he says, Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Serve. Well, same applies to a family. Let the husband <coughs> be a servant and serve. The word minister means one who ministers. And the word minister, look it up in the dictionary, means serve. A minister is a servant. One who ministers or serves the people the truth of God, the word of God, the counsel of God. And he says in verse 27, whoever desires to be first among you, you know, or number one, let him <coughs> be your slave. I think the Greek there is doulos, which means slave or bondservant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. We are to follow the example of Christ. He came not to be served, but to serve. And if we're going to follow his example, then we will receive a greater reward in his kingdom. As it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, First Peter chapter 2, <coughs> Peter writes, beginning in verse 17, Honor all people. Show honor to everyone. Love the brotherhood. Love all the brothers in the church. Fear God. Stand in awe of God. Honor the king. That is, honor the president. He may be a shapeshifter and have all kinds of problems, you know, but he's a human being. And he's also the king. So we're to honor him because he's human, a person like we are, and we're to honor him because he has authority, the president. So we honor him for his authority, his position, and for his humanity. And we leave his judgment to God. Because God will judge everyone for the good they do and the evil they do. Or think to do, or plan to do, or finally do. Or do not do. Servants, be submissive to your masters or your employers with all uh, respect or fear or respect. Not just to those who are good and gentle, but even to the harsh. For this is commendable if because of good conscience toward God we endure grief, even if we suffer wrongfully, if we're falsely accused about something. We should 
man up, as they say, and just take it like a man and and, and submit to it. And not fight back, not argue back or yell back, just even if we're in the wrong. I mean, if we're in the right and the other person's in the wrong, but they're exercising their authority in the wrong way, well, we should still be submissive, even to the harsh. For this is commendable, Peter says, if because of conscience toward God, the fear of God, we endure grief, even endure wrongdoing or harshness from someone, suffering wrongfully. Well, we should endure it. We should take it. Because Christ took it for us. He took it for us. But what credit, he says, is it if you are beaten for your faults? Or, or corrected, or, or chastised? If you take that patiently. But when you do good, you haven't done anything wrong, and you still suffer for it, and you, if you take that patiently, that is commendable with God. God sees that, and he's well pleased. Well pleased, happy with that. <clears throat> for, Peter says, verse 21, for this is what you were called to, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, nor did he talk back or argue. Who, when he was reviled or disrespect, disrespected, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten or, or talk back. But he committed himself to God the Father, who judges all righteously. And Christ bore our sins in his own body on the tree, by whose stripes we are healed. Because we were all like sheep going astray, all of us. But now we've returned to the shepherd, and the overseer of our souls. So we are returning, in the process of returning to God. And the Omer Count is helping us to do that. And to learn to get along, as Rodney King said years ago, why can't we all just get along? That's a good question. We all need to work on getting along, especially with our own families and mates and children, and try to undo the damage by re-backing up the movie film and going back to that place where we were still all together and starting over in our minds and starting to do good to one another. Send cards, send flowers, or just pray for one another. Pray for them. And we will see what God can do.